Okay, so this is the second half of physiological psychology. We did the nervous system, and of course the brain is a part of the nervous system. I love this picture of the brain, but it's the most sophisticated part, so I broke it into its own section. Now, if I can get it onto the next slide, the first thing I'm going to teach you about your brain is real easy. Your brain is a sphere, and when you cut it in half, a sphere is a hemisphere, <laughs> so there's two halves to your brain, and you can see, now I can draw in here right down the middle, it cuts it in half to the left half and the right half. That becomes important later on. It seems, you know, silly right now, but the left and right halves, or hemispheres, don't do the same thing. Okay. One of the other things about your brain before we get started is, is it con it's contra against lateral, the side. Against the side, what does that mean? It means you're crosswired. Like if I was in class, it's like when I raise my right hand, this is my right hand, my left brain was doing it. And when I raised my left hand, my right brain was doing it. So I don't know why we're crosswired, but we're crosswired. The right side of our body is controlled by the left side of our brain and vice versa. Okay, so the seven parts of the brain. I don't know why I got on this seven kick again. Remember the neuron, seven parts of the neuron. Okay, anyway, here's your brain. This is the sagittal view. So it's like the side view, but it's if I took the brain out of my head, I don't know if you can see what I'm doing, and I cut it in half right down the middle, right down the middle, and just looked at it from the side. Okay, so this is sagittal. Okay, so this is the front part, of course, and this is the back half of your brain. Now, if I look at the brain, the sagittal view, and I were to look at it from the top, we'll look at part one. But from the top, if I cut that little top part off and look down in it, I don't know if you can make sense out of my silly little drawing, it looks like this if I'm looking from the top, if I cut that part off. Now, if you notice, if I was in class, I would ask somebody, but if you notice, you can see this little band right here, and there's all these fibers that are leading to it. And I call this thing the bridge, part one, corpus callosum, and I think I have a bridge on here. Because it's a bridge between the left and right hand, uh, sides of your brain. Why would you need a bridge? Well, if I'm going to walk, <laughs> my left and right foot might need to talk to each other, right? So <laughs> if I'm by a, a human with two eyes and two feet and two hands, it's like I need communication across both sides. So that's part one. Even though it has a great big crazy name, Corpus Callosum, I just go CC is the bridge. And if I look at the sagittal view this way again, <clears throat> we were looking from the top, remember? But if I look at the sagittal view, here's the bridge right here is this little white piece that I'm outlining right here. That's the bridge. Okay, part two is called the cerebrum, or sometimes I'll call it the cerebral cortex, but the cortex is kind of the outside. I think of when someone says, what is your brains, like if you blew your brains out, I say the squiggledy part, and that's what I'm going to talk about is this big squiggledy part right here, okay, but I can't just say, oh, it's the bridge. It does a lot of things, and so for the test, number two is going to be the most important out of all seven. Okay, so how do we know what different parts do, like what this part does versus this part? Maybe I should pick a different pen here. You know, how do we know what the back does right here versus what the front does? Now, one of the ways that we uh, found out about this early on was brain damage. And I'm going to talk about a few cases of this. But another way is animal research. They've screwed around with animal brains, which I don't like, but they've done it. So, you know, we know from poking and prodding on animals. But the more sophisticated ways now, we don't have to do this. Because now we can do these things like PET scans, right, or MRIs or CAT scans. And so we can see what happens while you're thinking. Now, back to this one for a second, brain damage. There was this dude, Phineas Gage, who was working or something. This big pole went right through his head. It's so trippy. You can see where his eye was all effed up afterwards. 
Well, what did they do? I took all that meat out of his brain, and then Phineas had a lot of different problems. Well, those problems equaled those parts of the brain. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. So this early research on brain damage started helping us pinpoint what the squiggle part does, the cerebrum. Okay, the other researchers that come into play are Broca and Wernicke because they had patients that had problems with their speech or understanding speech. Broca had patients that could make noises but couldn't really make words. Wernicke had people that, you know, couldn't understand speech. But Broca, when he did these autopsies, I kind of went fast there, he would find, look, there's something missing, almost like Phineas Gage, but it was always on the left-hand side of their head. I don't know if this is coming out because I'm sitting there trying to be like I'm in class. So we started to find that the left-hand side, left hemisphere, remember the two sides, doesn't do the same thing as the right hemisphere. Why? Because, you know, they didn't have damage on the right side. So the left right here, and they have done future studies. I forgot I had this on here with the PET scans to verify these two things from Broca and Wernicke. Because if you look down here, listening to words would be Wernicke. He had damage here and they couldn't understand words. And Broca speaking words, see it lights up right here. Always on the left hand side. So this concept, I think I have this on here if I can get off of here, is hemispheric specialization. Now that might seem like a big fancy word, but if I can just draw a brain on here, or maybe I have one on here, I sure do. If I split it down the middle, the two halves, the left half don't do the same thing as the right half. They're specialized, thus the term hem hemispheric specialization. Left, we started finding out early on was like verbal abilities. The right is more like spatial abilities. And what is that? Well, I don't know. Just yesterday, it was like running around playing Wolfenstein 2. But if you play like a lot of video games, it's like you have to understand not only like maps of different areas, cognitive maps in your head. This is why parents say that video games don't teach you anything. They don't know about video games. Even simple games like Tetris, where you have to rotate things in three-dimensional spaces. And there's always puzzles. And I get stuck on games like Lara Croft Tomb Raider. It's like, what am I supposed to do? Do. It's like you put too much water in the bucket, dummy. And so there's these things that aren't really verbal, but we have to understand with our mind and uh, do spatially. Now, if we were in a class, I'd go off on this because if you're this kind of a person, well, then don't pick this as your major and vice versa. Like my dad was like this, but I'm real artsy. It's like, and so when I went into psychology, he's like, oh my God, you can't do that. It's like, we don't have the same brains. I'm sorry. What's the probability that we have the exact same brain? You know what I mean? Maybe some because it's genetic, but come on. It's like my uncle, he's a lawyer and all of his sons are lawyers. Is that really necessary? <laughs> I'm being silly right now, but really think, play to your strength. If this is your strength over here, play to it. But if it's not, don't go be a theater major. Okay, so here's the second thing I was gonna talk about, split brain patients. Split brain patients are these people back in the 1970s, I think it was, that um, they had severe epilepsy and they would go in and they would sever the bridge. Corpus callosum right here, they would cut it. Now they don't cut their eye cables, of course, but now they essentially have two hemispheres that don't communicate with each other. Now this is the trippiness, it's gonna get real weird. Okay, so here's the two hemispheres. And so if you remember contralateral, what they'll do is they'll show this lady, if I can get this off of here, um, a chimeric face. Chimeric comes from the Greek, or not Greek, I don't know if it's Greek, but there was a monster, the chimera. But anyway, it's half of a face, and on this side is Nicole Kidman, and on this side is Jennifer Lopez. I don't know if you know these people. <laughs> it's kind of an old example now. And so what they'll do is they'll ask this person that has two brains that don't have a bridge to connect, uh, tell me who you saw. Now, if you ask Tim, I go, uh, I see a picture and half of it's Nicole Kidman and half of it's J-Lo. And what they'll say is, I see Jennifer Lopez. And you go, that's the only person you see? Yes, just Jennifer Lopez. And then if they ask to point to who you see, they point to Nicole Kidman. I would point to both of them. 
I mean, can't you point to both of them? And so if you look at it this way, I don't know if this is making as much sense as it is in class. We're contralateral. So who's coming into my left brain? Let me see if I get it over here. J-Lo. So when I ask a task that's verbal, who do you see? Well, I can only say what's in there. Tell me that ain't trippy. <laughs> I say point. Point is a right hand uh, thing. Right brain. Well, who's in the right brain, Nicole Kidman? I can only point to what's in my right brain. For me, I have a bridge right here, so I can just do both. So do you. And so that's what, the only reason I give this example is it further illustrates the fact that the left side of your brain, verbal, is not doing the same thing as the right side of your brain, spatial. Okay, the last part of the cerebrum. The cerebrum is more sophisticated. That's why I had to talk about it more. But we learned that the left and right half don't do the same thing. Just keep that in mind. Left verbal, right spatial. The other thing that you need to know is that there's four general areas or lobes. Oh, I forgot. I was turning the wrong way the whole time. This is where your eyes are, right here, okay, the front part. Okay, so anyway, if I get this off here, the back part of the cerebrum is dedicated to visual information, and you saw that on the previous slides with J-Lo and Nicole Kidman going to the back of the head, right? So just remember that occipital receives visual information. The temporal lobe receives uh, information about hearing and smell, and if I were to draw like your ears somewhere right around in here and your nose is kind of right there, so that's hearing and smell. The blue part is on the front, and it's called the frontal, the easiest one to remember for the test. What goes on in the front? Thinking. I'm thinking right now, but I'm also thinking to put my hand on my head, which is somatic, right? I control my body. And then finally, the parietal is temperature, touch, and taste. So to review, vision, hearing and smell for temporal, frontal is thinking and voluntary control over my body, somatic, and then parietal is temperature, touch, and taste, this whole sensation of being in my body, which I hate the parietal lobe. I hope those four make sense. Now, if I come back to, let's see this part, if I can draw it right. Right in here is the frontal lobe, right? And this is the green part. This is the parietal lobe up in here. If I can get all this drawn off of here. Well, one of the things I can do, I'm doing it right now, is I'm controlling this pen with my hand. To see, it's right here with my hand. It's right up in here. But at the same time, I feel the pen in my hand, which is right here. So I have a sensation which this afferent information is coming in, giving me information about my body while I'm controlling my body at the same time. Now, if you're in my religion class, I would go into detail right here about this because when they do all this research on meditating monks and this, that, and the other yogis, uh, they're able to kind of disconnect from their body and like turn this section of their brain off. Okay. So, all I've taught you so far is about two parts of your brain, two, okay? So, number one was right here, the bridge, corpus callosum. It just connects the two halves, and we learned about that lady that got cut in half, right? Part two was the cerebrum. Cerebrum is the squiggly part. The two halves don't do the same thing, and there's four general areas of the cerebrum. Okay, let me move on. Oh, yeah, I forgot I had this. Let me turn the right way. Okay, it would be like this away because here are my eyeballs would be right here and here. Okay, so parts three, four, and five are so easy. Part number three is right here in the middle. If you can see this, right in the middle is this circle. And this circle is what I call the mail room. All of the sensory information that's afferently coming into my brain, the highway home, when it comes home, it stops off at the mail station. And then the postman goes, oh, it's vision. I'll put it right back here in occipital lobe. Temperature, touch, and taste. I'll sort it up here. Uh, hearing and smell, come down here. So later on, the thalamus becomes very important because when people have problems with this sorting mechanism, it's called synesthesia. I can never say this word right, but when they like taste colors and weird shit like that. Okay, so that's the thalamus. 
Okay, so the thalamus is right here. Actually, if I look underneath it from the underneath side, you could see that you have two of them. One, two, because you have two eyes, two ears, whatever, two feet, this, that, and Part number four is the cerebellum, but I kind of think of this thing like a bell on the back of your head. I don't know if I drew that good. <laughs> okay, and so the bell on the back of your head, not the cerebrum, bell for the test bell is your balancer. It's kind of a bad thing, but when I was young, I used to throw cats in the air, and they would always land on the ground because they're like X game athletes. They can rotate in the three-dimensional space. Well, gymnasts are like that. They have these great cerebellums, X game athletes. If you're an athlete and don't have a good cerebellum, you don't need to be an athlete. Okay, so for the test, that one's probably one of the easiest ones. The bell on the back of my head balances me out. Okay, and then the medulla. I can't talk about the medulla without thinking about Fight Club, but I don't want to go Fight Club right now. But the medulla is right down here at the very bottom. It's almost the beginning of the highway. See, this is your spinal cord, the highway home, the 101. And so it's at the lowest level. And if you think about, let me turn around the right way, <laughs> that the lowest level is the most primitive, which almost every animal, the stupidest animal in the world has that. And I call it the metronome because it controls everything autonomic. And if I go back to my lecture from last time, here we have automatic stuff and here I have conscious control why because it's the most sophisticated part of my brain and I didn't do this in this class but if I move up the phylogenetic spectrum this part gets more and more sophisticated and I could go into dolphins and pigs and other kinds of animals that have a lot of frontal area because they're smarter than other kinds of animals Okay, here we go. Parts six and seven are the last two parts, and they have to do with your hormones. And I want to get into this because this is your endocrine system, the last section on your review. But before I go there, let's go back through parts one through five. We talk about the cerebrum, the squiggledy part, the most important part. It has all these different areas, four different areas, right? And also had two halves. We talk about the bridge, easy, right? It's a long word, but corpus callosum, CC is the bridge that holds the two halves together and allows for communication. Uh, we talked about the thalamus here, which is the mail room, distributes the mail to the right place. We also talk about this bell on the back of your head that balances you out. And we talk about the medulla, which is like kind of keeps you alive, the metronome, all your automatic or autonomic stuff. And then back to the cerebrum, squiggledy part, besides having two halves, had four general areas, vision, hearing and smell, thinking and voluntary control, temperature, touch, and taste. Okay, part six and seven deal with your endocrine system. Endo is inside. You have an exocrine system. We sweat, we cry, it comes outside of our body. But this is stuff that goes inside of your body. Just like we have an endoskeleton, it's inside of our body. Bugs have an exoskeleton, their armor's on the outside. Okay, and so these hormones are released into our blood and they target various organs and tissues. So it's not electrical transmission, it's chemical transmission. But in this way, they do have a lock and key fit, just like the neurotransmitters. You don't just have one hormone fits all. And so there's hormones within hormones within hormones. I'm a dummy when it comes to endocrinology, but it does make me believe in God. And so... I can get off of here. There's all kinds of things. In my other class, I talk a lot about this because, you know, I could talk about testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. I could talk about menstrual cycle, pregnancy, all these different things that go on. Uh, if you have problems with diabetes, you have a problem right here. Insulin production, type 1, type 2. If you have problems with growth, metabolism, thyroid, just like baseball players were taking HGH to modify how much was targeting organs and tissues, right? But who's in control? These two guys right up here, hypothalamus and pituitary. So part six, I call the thermostat because it detects if there's any imbalance in your body. If your blood sugar is too high or low, are you too hot or too cold? All these different things that could be out of whack. Now when they're out of whack, the thermostat relays this information to part number seven, which is the pituitary gland. I call him the conductor. He's like, well, there's all these things that could be out of whack. What's out of whack? And so then he goes like an orchestra leader and saying, well, the percussion seems okay, but the uh, winds are off. You know what I mean? And 
so he could like fix something. There's actually a lot of thermostats inside of your hypothalamus, not just one. You can see for, you know, hunger, thirst, you know, your sex drive, like sleepy, awake, all these different things. You know, and so down in here with all these little baby thermostats that I have, now they could detect different things. And then up here in the hypothalamus, they can send this information and the pituitary knows exactly which thermostat went off, like your blood sugar, and then goes and fixes just that one. I hope I'm doing a good job here. So I come back here, here's your thermostat, it goes off, pituitary says, okay, I know which one to fix. And so then he comes down here and he says, oh, it may be something like Tim's blood sugar is off, so I want to target the pancreas. And then it targets it for a while until it gets back into balance and then it turns it off. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so blood sugar is the easiest one to use. Sorry, I keep picking on this one. But I'm a bad person about this. Like yesterday, just drank a bunch of monsters and ate, you know, a bunch of candy and this, that, you know, and get a big sugar high. And I love being up here. But then sometimes, a couple of days ago, I didn't eat all day long. And I love having a hypoglycemic moment, hypo, undersugared, hyperglycemic, oversugared. You should keep your sugar level around the same, you know, place because then your energy won't be off, Tim. Okay, so I tend not to be a good candidate for this. But you want your thermostat to fix things. You don't want your house to go up to 90 degrees when you're on 72 and it goes, oh, wait a minute, I should have been cooling it down this whole time, right? You don't need these wild swings and whatever. So back to this example with blood sugar. Now, if I'm talking about blood sugar, for people who are diabetic, when they get too much blood sugar, for normal people, the pancreas would release insulin and would take some of that sugar out of their bloodstream and put it into their liver. But because you don't produce insulin or enough insulin, this one right here, type 1, type 2, then you get can become over sugared real fast and there's nothing you can do about it now on the reverse side for tim since his works fine i can abuse my body it's like when i get under sugared hypoglycemic what happens the uh, hypothalamus knows tim doesn't have enough blood sugar the uh, conductor says okay pancreas what are you going to do about this release glucagon they never talk about this one what does glucagon do takes that stored sugar in tim's liver and puts it back into his bloodstream so this is a really neat thing that's balancing out all the time without me ever thinking about it this is the beauty of the endocrine system i don't know if i'm doing a good job okay so if you're a diabetic what do you do you have to sit there and poke your finger all the time with this thing or maybe there's that thing you put on your arm now and you just constantly check it so that you monitor your sugar and have to go take insulin to do this thing manually and so the beauty of it for being a non-diabetic is this is all happening and you don't have to do it manually <laughs> you know what i mean and think about i'm not even doing a good job on endocrinology right now there are feedback loops within feedback loops of hormones within hormones that make all this thing occur if you let's say get into a near crash let's say i'm on the 101 and like whatever someone wrecks into my car it's like immediately my brain detects something off, including my hypothalamus. It's like, uh-oh, Tim's in a threatful situation. Pituitary, what are you going to do? Uh, I'm going to go talk to Tim's adrenal glands, and I'm going to release adrenaline and cortisol. And so later on, we'll talk about cortisol. But right now, adrenaline, you know what adrenaline does. It's like I want to give Tim a bunch of energy because he's in a dangerous situation. You know what that's called? Fight or flight. And after the crash is over, though, two days later, I don't need to keep tweaking about the crash. I need to come down off that shit, the turn off loop. But sometimes we don't turn off. Okay, but I should turn off eventually once the crash is gone, right? I didn't know I had it over here. Okay, so once again, heart six is the uh, thermostat. 
and part seven is the pituitary. And in this example, they were communicating together to, you know, you can't see this over here, uh, talk to my adrenal glands in this particular situation. This goes back to the fight or flight stuff that we uh, have with the uh, nervous system. And so in a way, this is what's kickstarting that sympathetic division. Once I have the adrenaline, of course, my eyes get black and I breathe fast and my heart rate goes a million miles an hour and I don't feel like eating and my blood is coursing through my body. I hope I did a good job on this section. That's everything for the endocrine system. I'll see y'all next time.